The culture of a hunter demands a more solid core musculature to navigate around the wide open spaces with limited hunting equipment. This simplistic and dynamic culture would require a flexible posture and gait during hunting to adapt. Hunting on horseback would require a repetitive, stress sitting posture with high variability. The musculature around the trunk and in the legs would be constantly adjusting to maintain upright position. During a typical hunt, like in the picture, the hunter would need to actively maintain posture from the bumpy and unpredictable ride on the horse, as well as adjust his torso to prepare to strike. The postural adjustment depends on the location of the animal and the angle of the weapon of choice. The horse and hunting setting are indicative of this culture, and the hunter needs to adapt. While riding the horse, the hunter might need to hunch forward or backward to maintain balance and properly execute movements during the hunt. The culture of a typical American today does not come close to the horseback and simplistic nature of the hunters. However, even when compared with people who ride horses today, there is so much more equipment that changes the need for postural change to the degree of the hunter. There are also weapons that do not require as much physical movement or strength. The Eskimo, or those living in colder climates, are required to adapt through heavy clothing, smaller homes, and bundling, which could influence their posture depending on the weight, space, and size. Wearing heavy fur coats will keep them warm, but it will also require them to use more muscle or develop muscle to adapt to the extra weight of the fur clothing that could hunch their posture. Also, the nature of the cold environment could cause sitting postures and other postures to become more balled up and less extended to conserve warmth. This could influence the muscles involved in posture stabilization and the outward appearance of their posture. In the exhibits at the museum, the people are wearing floor-length fur coats, boots, and other articles of clothing to keep them warm. Their general appearance is a hunched and ball-like posture. The movement patterns of these people would appear to require a bit more energy to move the extra weight on their bodies. This can be seen in heavy boots, having to clear the ground, or in just trying to clear the snow and traverse their environment. Lastly, the igloo homes are small and require a shorter posture to navigate in effectively. This can be done through hunching of the shoulders and head. Today, most of the homes we see have adequate ceiling height, so the hunching to accommodate structural spaces is not seen. Depending on where you live, the clothing requirements are adjusted, but generally we have more efficient fabrics to keep us warm, rather than heavy fur coat. Lastly, there are many devices and means of transportation that allow us to avoid walking through the snow on a regular basis, eliminating the need for excessive energy expenditure. Understanding the effect of different cultures and environments on a patient you're treating makes all the difference. Even if the culture is as slight as a subculture within the United States, regional differences, or an activity preference such as sports, this can guide your ability as a PT to diagnose, make goals, and treat effectively. Depending on the setting you work in, you may see drastic differences in culture. For instance, like on a mission trip to another country. However, even being mindful of the difference in environment between a runner and a swimmer in your practice can be valuable. Both of these environments affect posture in a different way. By visiting the museum, we were able to see a stark contrast between several different cultures and the extreme nature of its effect on posture and movement. This experience will prepare us for sensitivity to environmental and cultural differences in our practice.